السلام عليكم <تصفيق> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله والآله الصحيح ونوده بعد I'm so honored and blessed to be with you with uh, Sister Karen to benefit from her wisdom and experience Brother Muhammad, all of you I have a confession to make I'm actually feeling really exhausted um, and I think if I was home I'd be asleep and doing something very useless right now kind of missed breakfast and lunch today a uh, little bit of jet lag but it feels great to dig deep for this because it's a worthy cause. And so I respect your presence and your sacrifice here today. I respect the presence of our teachers and our volunteers who worked hard to make this possible. So inshallah we'll try to do, make the best uh, and the most of this time because I think the challenges that face us are worth it. You know, thinking about what Sister Karen was sharing there, we start talking about uh, Credibility. What does it take to have the credibility and have the voice to be able to shape and impact the perception and opinion of others? And you know, this topic is really uh, tightly tied with the role and message of prophethood throughout the lineage of the prophets. And Prophet Muhammad even before his prophethood was part of the divine shaping and preparation of his cre credibility with people. Uh, first, that he was among them, that he loved them, that he cared for them and genuinely wanted their benefit. But the second thing was his character was unassailable. He was known to people as a sadiq al-amin, the trustworthy, the, the honest and the trustworthy. And in fact, the Qur'an affirms that when they when some of the kuffar of Quraysh did not like what he came with they couldn't come up with a very intelligent criticism of his character Allah says وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُ يَضِيقُ صَدْرُكَ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ that we know that your chest is constricted by that which they say about you فَإِنَّهُمْ لَا يُكَذِّبُونَكْ وَلَكِنَّ الظَّالِمِينَ بِآيَةِ اللَّهِ يَجْحَدُونَ that they do not actually think you are a liar but the wrongdoers they hold Allah's ayat Allah's signs in earnest contempt and so when they sought to you know, attack his character, they really couldn't find a convincing argument. And so it was a bit of uh, media mudslinging, much like what we're do seeing today against the body of Muslims. It was calling him a sahir, a magician, a soothsayer, a madman. Uh, they could not really find an intellectual argument. And in many senses, of course, the character of the Muslims today cannot be compared to the character of the prophets. It's a much higher level. But in some small but meaningful way, what you see today against Muslims, as you have seen it against countless minorities before, is revving up the engine of this prejudice machine. And by the way, if you look up the word prejudice, the very essence of what prejudice is, is to paint a group with a broad brush in a manner that defies reason and intellect. It is fundamentally an uninformed, uneducational process. And today, you know half of Americans have never met a Muslim in their entire lives, consciously. This is from Pew Research. Statistics, not something I heard in a convention. You can look it up for yourself. Half, more than half of Americans have never consciously met a Muslim in their lives. And I'll tell you, I used to have a lot of difficulty believing this statistic until I, st until I started surveying non-Muslims that would visit our masjid at the Islamic Association of Raleigh. And so when we'd have open houses, and keep in mind, these are some of the most courageous people of other faiths that will step foot in an Islamic center, that will come learn about Islam on the turf of the masjid, if you will. And now we would survey, we would ask questions, how many of you have ever met a Muslim before today? And less than 20, 15% of people would raise their hands. Some of the people that weren't raising their hands were in their 70s, having never met a Muslim. How many people have never been to a masjid before? 
More than 95% of people would raise their hand, never been to a masjid before. So think about it for a moment. Think if you're in their shoes so that you can understand what it takes to gain credibility. Then what does that leave as a definition of Islam for you? If you're that half of America and you've never consciously met a blood and flesh Muslim, what does that leave? That leaves the mass media. That leaves popular culture. That leaves Osama bin Laden and Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and ISIS and al-Qaeda. And that's not a comforting thought at all. So in many ways when you see that ugly stare in the mall or you see someone a little bit hesitant in your presence, in many ways they're not reacting to you. They're reacting to what has been said about you and your religion. And you know uh, in the study of Real Bad Arabs, R-E-E-L, did I spell that right? R-E-E-L, there's two, like the real from the movie. Real Bad Arabs, they estimate that 80% of portrayals of Muslims in Hollywood and popular culture are negative. Young Muslims or South Asians or uh, Middle e people of Middle Eastern descent, they are genuinely struggling building a career right now in Hollywood because the available roles are terrorists and homeland and these shows that's what's out there that's and the New York Times released a study that showed that the portrayal of Islam in mainstream media is on par with the portrayal of marijuana in terms of the proportion of positive and negative coverage so when you talk about credibility today in my mind Credibility is recognizing what has happened on the scene and rising above that narrative, learning to change it. Not always being on the defensive, but actually working to change the narrative for ourselves, to tell our own story. And, you know, in reality, one of the reasons that we should feel confident in telling this story is because it is uninformed. It is, I mean, forgive me for the word, but it is genuinely dumb and stupid. It is statistically wrong, it is factually wrong, and it is very much prejudiced. So you can look at it by the numbers. You know, take the Department of Defense's statistics. They estimate that about 100 American Muslims have successfully or unsuccessfully tried to aid ISIS, whether materially or by traveling or whatever. This includes the people that failed or were caught or died or whatever. Pew Research puts the number of American Muslim men, women, and children estimated at about 3.3 million. Anybody good at mental math or have a calculator app? That's 0.003%. But if you watch too much of the news, you would think that your Muslim neighbor is plotting something to hurt you. Every time that there's a radical Muslim who does something, they're not painted as a bad apple. They're painted as part of this holistic whole that is out to get America. And we should develop the confidence and the understanding to stand up, not be defensive, not be intimidated, and simply say, this is not true. If I walked up to you and told you, you look like an alien. Would you get intimidated and scared? No, I'm just simply clueless and also without respect and character. So in many senses, it's more serious, it's more dangerous, but we as an American Muslim community need to take back our own narrative and tell our own story. Because even if these people claim to be Muslim and falsely ascribe their actions to the religion, that doesn't make it true. And it doesn't make it my fault and your fault. We need to start talking about 
the ills of colonization, of imperialism. We need to talk about the contribution to these problems that are outside the Islamic theological issue and not accept that this false narrative is thrust upon us and more importantly our children. I'll tell you how nonsensical such a portrayal is. You know, uh, there was a cover story on The Atlantic a couple months ago. And its study showed that you are 10 times more likely to be killed by an armed toddler than by a radical Islamic immigrant jihadist. So I guess we should start calls to bend toddlers. And you know what's, what else is informative? You're 5,000 times more likely to be shot by a fellow armed American in the growing epidemic of mass murders and of gun violence than to be harmed by a radical Islamic immigrant jihadist. When we look at these, and we need to understand our own story, part of our responsibility, and there's no getting away from it, is putting out the fires, is reacting to what has been falsely done, is crisis management, is staying afloat, and keeping our rights and our community protected. But eventually, if the American Muslim community is to excel, they must not only survive, but they must also learn to thrive in these times of difficulty. So part of this is that we learn to build our own institutions. Part of it is to build our own capacity. And I reiterate the words of Professor Carl Ernst of UNC Chapel Hill, who is not a Muslim but has done some very respectable work on Islamophobia and on prejudice. And he says what Muslims need to hear. He says as long as we are complaining about our inability to shape our narrative, but we continue to only push our children into medicine and engineering and other service professions while ignoring the humanities and the arts and the social sciences where stories are shaped, then our concern is not sincere to start with. I say this to you as an MIT engineer. I'm not disrespecting the engineers in the room. And I never thought I would serve as Imam. But one of my motivations when I was called to serve was that I got tired of people putting words in my mouth before I ever had a chance to speak. I got tired of being judged across the park or across the mall or across the airport for something I had never done, never supported, and never had anything to do with. So part of this challenge is learning to tell our own story and learning to question the narrative. In many ways, you can think about the challenge of our education, and there's much to say, but I want to wrap up to make sure we get time to benefit um, from the experience of inshallah of the panel and, and Sister Karen and, and to engage your questions. But in many ways, if I were to focus on an angle to look at education as we discuss it today, you can think about it as the demediification. That's a word you can add it, inshallah, if, you know, to your dictionaries. The demediification of people. That ultimately, most of you will not be imams, will not be chaplains. Most of you may never serve as the interfaith lead in your masjid. But each of us has an opportunity to change part of that narrative through our circle of influence and the people we touch and impact. And if Americans believed that, if you and I were to live up to our responsibility to portray this religion through action before words, then the media dollars of the universe could not overcome the narrative that you and I put into action on the ground. Ultimately, this lack of credibility 
is a statement that you and I have not fully impacted our neighbors. It is a testament that you and I have not fully portrayed Islam as it deserves to be portrayed and conveyed. It's a statement that we were not there for the poor. To statement that we were not to be found in city center as the Prophet ﷺ was always in the center of Mecca. It's a statement that we weren't in the prisons. That we weren't working in that pastoral and chaplaincy work. It's a statement and an opportunity for us to grow, to serve in all of the dimensions of Islam that are not behind a microphone or behind a camera. And it's important that all of us live up to that responsibility because ultimately that's where that credibility is to be gained back. It's to be gained back on the ground, locally, with the things that will not be celebrated on the airwaves, but that Allah is most knowledgeable of and may reward you more than the most famous of people. It's to be gained back when America realizes that one in ten doctors in the United States is a Muslim. And you are much more likely to be healed by a Muslim in your lifetime than to be harmed by one. Once I was sharing this at a church and literally after the talk a line of people came reaching into their purses and pocketbooks telling me, you're right, I never realized that Dr. Farooq, my cardiologist, Dr. James, my pulmonologist, all of this and they saw that experience. It's when we have the courage to say, if you're part of that half of America that has never met a Muslim, I guess you've never been in an Uber or a taxi. Because there's a lot of phenomenal conversations that are happening from Muslims serving in that role. And it's a statement, inshallah, that our neighbors, our colleagues, our classmates, our co-workers, inshallah, I pray their narrative will be shaped by our impact on them. So I ask Allah to use us uh, in what pleases Him and to guide through us. Allahumma ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, uh, many Muslims, actually even non-Muslims, you know, regular Americans live in silos, live within their communities, their churches, their synagogues, their masajid. This question, uh, questioner asks, what instances can Muslims be less, uh, what instances can Muslims be less disconnected from the broader American Muslim, American Muslim population, aside from interfaith? So basically, what other than interfaith can, if somebody, if I was living in my house, I go to work, I come home, who can I engage with to you know, teach about Islam or have people know about Muslims. Um. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, no connection of both, both questions actually. Uh, coming out of the cocoon is very uncomfortable. And connecting with people that are difficult, different from us can be challenging. But the Prophet ﷺ did connect with people of other faiths around lots of topics of shared interest. Things like social justice is a great opportunity. Things like caring for those that are less privileged, whether that's helping the homeless or helping the needy or serving in a lot of the increasing Muslim population in prisons that needs service and Juma khutbas and, and halaqat and so on and so forth. And also standing... Um, for the rights of others, not just the rights of Muslims. These are all opportunities you can find at your local uh, masajid or organizations and relief organizations and so on. I think it's important to uh, note very briefly that you don't need to be a scholar to understand what's permissible and what's not in these issues. You need to connect with trustworthy scholarship. And as an imam, I have never taken heat and absolute hatred for anything as much as the interfaith work, the limited interfaith work we do at, at Raleigh in Chicago, it's much more. And I'm not above criticism, but most of the criticism we've gotten has been incredibly misinformed and very ignorant. 
quite honestly. And so as Muslims, we have to be literate. There are big councils of scholars that have spoken about the permissible and the impermissible. Uh, the American Muslim Jurist Association, AMJO, which is a very conservative body, has extensive work on things that are permissible, not impermissible, and interfaith work. You can connect with activists who are senior and imams who can help you guide, uh, guide you in that work. But keep in mind to always look for what's permissible on one hand, but then the other hand is to look for what's strategic. You know, so it's a lot of what Sister Karen was talking about was sometimes there are opportunities that are not strategic or not meaningful even if they are permissible. And so especially for MSA leaders, for young uh, masjid leaders, I encourage you not to be isolated in these decisions because they are difficult decisions. Rely on the shura process, talk to your faith leaders, talk to senior members of their congregation, and inshallah you'll find many, many good opportunities to connect and serve inshallah. Thank you very much. Please help me thank uh, Sister Karen Danielson and Dr. Muhammad Abu Talib for a wonderful um, session. Thank you for coming out today and then we're getting ready for